welcome back my friends. We're on stress concentration factor for solids today. What in the world? You might hear this also as a stress riser. Okay, so what in the world is that? Let me, let me kind of explain this to you right quick, okay? Number one, you got to understand something called stress flow. Okay. How does stress flow through an object that's under load? Okay. And really what we're worried about are these geometry changes as that stress flows through an object. And here's our problem. We're going to work this in a minute, but you know, as this force is transmitted through this part, the stress has to go down here and then it goes out big and then it goes around a hole. What does that stress do as it flows around those changes in geometry? Now you're going to see this most commonly at your house. Okay. Here's your house. Yes, this is a very simple drawing. Okay. There's your house. That's your roof. Okay. So your walls are supporting a lot of load. They're supporting the rafters and they're supporting the roof material and the plywood underneath that and all the shingles on top of that. And today outside it's snowing in Texas. I don't know what's going on. And there's a snow load on the roofs. So there's a lot of weight on the roof. Now the weight of that roof is carried by the walls. So imagine that weight is all being transmitted through these walls to the floor, to the ground. Okay. So how does that stress flow? Well, guess what else you have at your house? You have doors and then someone decided to put windows at your house. I don't know what that was all about, right? So you've got doors and you've got a window. Now, the window can't support the load. There's an opening there, right? I mean, it wants to just collapse right there. So what happens is, is that stress has to flow around those windows and down these walls to the floor. Cause really this is carrying all the load, right? Same around the door, right? The stress has to flow around the door and around that window and on down the wall, right? And so what you get are these, what we call stress risers or stress concentrations at any abrupt changes in the geometry. Okay. I'll bet you, if you have an old house that you can go outside, you can look at your house and you'll see cracks in your brick like that. Or if you're inside your house and you look over at your door in your room right now, you'll see cracks in the sheetrock right? Coming out from the corners of those doors. Why is that? Because there is a stress concentration there. The stress is very high at those sharp corners. How can you reduce that? Well, and, and what I want you to think about is think about like this. Here is a river. Okay. There's a river. The river is running this way. Okay. There we go. The river's running that way. What do you know if there is a big boulder in the river? What's going to happen? Well, you get these, these eddies behind that boulder, right? You get a very turbulent area right there. Okay. That's high stress that the water cannot flow easily around that. Now, how do you make that much less the same boulder in the river, but make the stress lower, make the turbulence go down. Well, put another boulder in front of it and another boulder in front of that. And then one behind it, and then another boulder behind that, right? I, there's still the same number of boulders in there, but now the water, what does it do? It doesn't eddy like that. It's not turbulent at all. The water comes around and flows right around this. And so you can smooth out that flow. And that's exactly what happens on the uh, stress at your, at your house. Okay. So how do I fix all this? Well, one way, to lower the stress, you still got to have a door because you got to get in your house, right? But maybe you have like a, a Spanish style door with a rounded top on it. Now that stress can gently flow around that. And what happens? You don't see those cracks like you do on a sharp corner door. Maybe you want to have, I don't know, it's goofy looking maybe, but if you had round windows, same thing, right? The stress is going to flow around less stress. I've seen this on sidewalks, right? You'll have concrete poured and then they'll have, I don't know, there's one at our place where there's a, a manhole cover. Well, the concrete, guess what? Is cracked out right at those corners because there's stress there. That concrete as 
when it bends, when it flexes, the first place that the stress gets high is right in those sharp corners, and so it cracks there, okay? So anywhere we have a transition in the geometry of a part, you're gonna have this stress concentration, these stress risers, okay? And that's what we're talking about today, okay? So we have an equation to calculate what is that, okay? And that is K. Now K is what we call the stress concentration factor, okay? The stress concentration factor. And the stress concentration factor is sigma, well, that's not a good sigma. Sorry about that. Sigma max, okay? What is that maximum stress? It may not be, it may be more than just P over A if you have a transition with a really sharp corner. Now, this one has a nice radius corner here. As a matter of fact, this radius is radius equals 0.25 inches, right? But if that was less, if that was like 0.0625, that's a sixteenth of an inch, that's almost a sharp corner there, right? Then there's a, a higher stress riser there. You're going to get a bigger sigma max. But K is equal to sigma max divided by sigma average. Now, we know sigma average. That's just P over A, isn't it? Okay? So, what we're going to be talking about today is how in the heck do you find K? to find what the sigma max is on these problems with abruptly changing geometries, okay? Now, I'm going to show you a chart over here in just a second. Okay, let's see if we can work this little problem here. It says find the maximum stress in the bar, okay? Now, what I want you to do is I'm going to let you look in your book, and I want you to find these tables, okay? Now, I have it torn out of my book. There's these two tables here, one here, one here. One of these tables is for what we call fillets, okay? This is a fillet. Not to be confused with a fillet, that's what you do to a fish, okay? This is a fillet. It's a, 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 a radius corner, that's all a fillet is, okay? And the other chart over here has to do with holes. And we have a hole, of course, right there with a 0.75 inch diameter, okay? So we're gonna to have to investigate, what is the maximum stress at the fillet? Guess what? We'll use the fillet table. What is the maximum stress at the hole? Guess what? We're gonna use the hole table. And then we'll compare those and see which one is the highest because it says find the maximum stress. So does the maximum stress, stress uh, occur due to the fillet or due to the hole? We don't know. We're gonna to have to find out, okay? So now, hear ye, Hear ye, okay? Listen to me now. There are two of these in your book. There are two stress concentration factor tables in your book, and they are different, okay? Don't forget this, okay? This is the stress concentration due to an axial load, due to the stretching along an axis, okay? If you go to chapter six, you'll find this again, but in chapter six, it's Stress concentration due to beam bending, okay? And the numbers on the table are different. The stress concentration factors on the table are different. Everything's different. So don't get those two confused, okay? This is in chapter four in the elongation of a material, right? The axial elongation. That's what we're working on here. And the other one is in beam bending. So I've seen that mistake made before, but not us. We're way smarter than that, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the fillet, and I'm going to put the fillet table uh, over there, okay? I'll try not to stand over there because I've got an overlay going, okay? So we're looking at the fillet. The beautiful thing about stress concentration factor is all of the formulas are actually on the chart, okay? Look at the chart. All the stress concentration factor equations are on there that we need, okay? So let's start off with, because what we're looking, look down on the bottom axis down there. On the bottom axis, you'll see this. They want us to find, for the fillet, R over H. Well, you just go up to the picture and go, what's H? Oh, H is this thickness right here, okay? So R divided by H is equal to, H is this, 1.25, and then what is R? It tells you, R is the radius right there, 0.25. Okay, 
So our R over H is what? It is on 0.25 divided by 1.25 is 0.2, okay? So there's their number that we're gonna use on the bottom axis of our um, table here, okay? Now, what is sigma average? Sigma average, we need sigma average, don't we? Gosh, you know what? We're looking for sigma max, sigma max. This is, this is a fillet, okay? And sigma max is equal to, move that to the other side, K times sigma average. Okay, what is sigma average? I don't even know, man. Sigma average is this. It's just P over A. And if, and if you're super slow, Johnny Weak Sauce, don't be Johnny Weak Sauce, but look here. They put the equation for sigma average on the picture. Come on, Johnny Weak Sauce, you got it. It's, it's easy, isn't it? It's P, which is equal to two kips divided by A, which is this little cross-sectional area right there, right? It's 1.25 times 0.125. Okay, and let's see what that is. 0.125 times 1.25 equals, okay, and then divide that into two. Two divided by answer equals 12.8, okay? So 12.8 KSI, kips over inches squared, right? So there's sigma average, now all we need, we need K. Now there's a couple things you need on K. If you'll notice on your table here, look on our chart over there, you see a whole bunch of lines, don't you? A whole bunch of lines. Which one of those lines do we have to look at? Well, then it tells us you need to know what W over H is to tell which one of those lines to look at. What's W? W is this big width here. 1.875. H, what's H? H is this small height over here. 1.25. So our W over H is 1.875 divided by 1.25 equals 1.5. Okay. So look at that chart over there, okay? If you look at that chart, right, you need to find the line that says 1.5. Oh, I see him on my chart. I'm looking at him. Now I need to find where that line intersects 0.2, okay? So all the way over there on the side, right, you see 0.2 come up to the 1.5 line, and then you read across, and what do you get? Let's see, 1.5 and 0.2. I'm talking about like one point. 7, 2 maybe, okay? So K equals 1.72. And I read that off of the intersection of the 1.5 line and the 0.2 line, right? Where those two come together, I read across and K is on the vertical axis, I see 1.72. So how hard is it now to find out what this is? Well, this sigma max for the fillet is just equal to 12.8 KSI times, and this guy is unitless, right? He's just a, a modifier, times 1.72, okay? And that number is one that I read off of the chart, okay? So clear, 12.8 times 1.72 equals 22.01. So sigma max fillet equals 22.01 KSI, okay? That's sigma max at the fillet. Let's check out the hole, okay? So I'm gonna put a new chart over there. Bam! There's the chart for the hole, okay? You'll notice that it's very similar to the other one, but here we go. What is, what is first sigma average? Sigma average. Again, they give you an equation. Did we need an equation? No, we don't need an equation because sigma average is still P over A. What's the smallest cross-sectional area in this whole thing? You know what? It's right here. It's right, right there's one, and then there's another one right there, right? So what are those? If I add those two little rectangles together, I get the cross-sectional area that's going to tear in half as I pull it apart, right? 
So what is that cross-sectional area? Well, it's just 1.875, 1.875 minus 0.75, right? Minus the whole times the thickness, right? Times 1.2, no, 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 that's not the thickness. 0.125, right? There's the thickness right there. What's P? P still, two kips, okay? Again, that's an inch squared, so here we go. Clear, 1.875 minus 0.75 equals times 0.125 equals 0 0.140625, and then two divided by that, two divided by answer equals 14.22. Okay, so the sigma average is 14.22 KSI. Now let's see right quick if we can read off the um, stress concentration factor, K, for this one. So look at our chart over there. What do we want? We only have two lines this time. We just have a 2R over W. We need to calculate 2R over W. Well, that's easy. 2Rs is 2 radius. That's just 0.75 divided by W, which is 1.875. So that number is going to be what? 0.75 divided by 1.875, 0.4. Okay, so let's go to our table right there and look at the 0.4, follow it up to the line, read across, and read off K. I'm going to do it on my chart again. Whoop, whoop. Oh, it's 2.2, isn't it? So K for the whole equals 2.2, again, a unitless number. So sigma max for the whole is what? 14.22 times 2.2. So sigma max for the whole is equal to 14.22 times 2.2 equals 31.28, 31.28 KSI, bam. So this, the hole, the stress is much higher at the hole than it is at the fillet. Again, like I said, if we were to come in here and make this little curve right here, this little radius much smaller, then the stress would go up there and then that might be the biggest stress on the whole part. Anyway, I hope that helps you understand what stress concentration factors are what stress risers are, what stress flow is, and I hope this helps you, and I'll see you on the next video.